Welcome to the Sky Cricket Podcast at the end of an extraordinary day for Test Cricket generally, really, with a, an upset down in Brisbane where West Indies pulled off one of the greatest victories in their history. And here where I am in Hyderabad, uh, where England have pulled off an astonishing win to go 1-0 up in the series. Nas, uh, you've been watching in, in, in Essex. What, what have you made of it all? Unbelievable day for Test Match Cricket. I got up at four o'clock. The alarm was set like at one minute to four. I didn't have to get up to do me barnet or anything like that. I just had to get out of bed and get the old quilt downstairs on the sofa. And I had the control in the hand and I was flicking from one game to the other and back. And, you know, the West Indies one obviously finished first. What an outcome that was. In fact, what a Test Match that was. Went one way then the other, some great scenes there. And then all my attention went on the England-India uh, game. And even that one went one way, then the other. We were texting each other saying, right, let's get it done. Seven wickets down. Stokes is brilliant <laughs> run out. We'll be doing this soon. And then there was that partnership. Outstanding day of Test Match cricket. It's why we love it so much, Ath. It is why it is the great, greatest format. Um, brilliant four days of Test Match cricket. Yeah, we had some fun here because obviously that, that game was going on and it was coming to a conclusion at the, at the Gabba about mid-afternoon, um, our time in Hyderabad. And, and in the press box, although the England game was very tense, everybody, when the nine wickets were down uh, in Australia, everybody was huddled around one laptop uh, watching the end when Hazelwood was on strike. And when, when he got the last wicket, Shamar Joseph, uh, the, the press box went mad. And then about five minutes later, in the ground, there was a lovely moment. The Barmy Army trumpeter sounded up the great David Rudder uh, anthem, Rally Round the West Indies. So all the Barmy Army were singing to that. So England supporters today in absolute clover because they've seen Australia go down and they've seen uh, England win an unbelievable win as well. I mean, I, I saw some of the reaction, tried to follow a bit of the reaction in Australia some great scenes down there. The video of Smithy calling the moment uh, alongside Brian Lara, who looked very emotional. Carl Hooper looked really emotional. I got some WhatsApps from Ian Bishop. Um, I mean, a real sense that this is, you know, an unbelievable achievement, really, completely against the odds. A young, inexperienced team against the mighty Australia on home turf. Don't lose many games, as England know to their cost. Don't lose many test matches at home. Uh, and then this story that we touched on, actually, didn't we, with Johnny Grave when he was on our podcast, Shamar Joseph from uh, this little village up the Kanji River in Guyana. Uh, what a story that is, giving up his job as a security guard to give professional cricket a go, taking a wicket with his first ball in that first test of Steve Smith, getting five wickets there, uh, and then an unbelievable performance uh, with, a, with an injured yeah. toe and running in all day long to take that final wicket today. I mean, just remarkable what one podcast with me and you can do after <laughs> West Indies cricket. Resurrection of West Indies cricket. <laughs> if anyone from Australian cricket or Indian cricket wants to come on this week to try and turn around your fortunes, we're happy to do that. So, yeah, I saw those scenes. Lara in tears. Cool Carl. I mean, cool Carl Hooper in tears in the dressing room. And we know Bish. Bish is a quietly spoken man, but he's very close to the team and West Indies cricket. He would have been so proud of that performance, and in particular, Shamar Joseph, having had his foot blown away by a uh, staff <laughs> late last night, hobbling off. He was hobbling to the back of his mark today. Um, what a performance. Eight runs, you know. That was someone tweeted today that England's win was the greatest test match since, well, four hours ago at the Gabba. <laughs> Two brilliant outcomes today. Sorry to interrupt you. I was very amused by Craig Brathwaite's uh, response, uh, you know, in the, in the post-match press conference when he, he got stuck into Rodney Hogg and said, you know, he'd call them pathetic and useless or something. And he wanted to prove Rodney Hogg, sh Hogg wrong and then showed his guns. And I, I was thinking if we ever won a test match in Australia, which was not very often, I think I won one. I'm not sure you ever did, but I'm not sure either of us have been showing our guns at the post-match press conference. And did you see? Um, did you see the celebration for the Kevin Sinclair wicket when he was doing cartwheels? I, I send it to my lad Joel, saying, "Imagine the reaction if someone gets you out like that in a club game." I'm not sure you'd be walking <laughs> off with a smile on your face. 
I just I was actually just hoping it wasn't given as a no ball, actually, doing all those cartwheels, <laughs> and then suddenly you have to bowl it all over again. That it that, that's why they are so brilliant. They are such a joy to watch. You know, the West Indies running after Joseph after that last wicket. He was doing laps of the ground. Um, great scenes at the Gabba. What about you? I mean, I've seen you file your copy in railway stations, in on trains, on planes, on the ground, sitting in the outfield. Um, in a tuk-tuk, did you, an hour back from the ground, have you had time to reflect on England and write your copy? Yeah, I sent it actually from the ground. Um, it was one of those days where it was very nerve-wracking, not because of the time difference and the deadlines, but you just didn't know what was going to happen. It looked for a long way out, obviously, uh, as if England were going to win once they once they got uh, India seven down. And then that partnership between Ashwin and Barat took India, I think they put on, what, 57 or 54 or something. And then it started to get nervy. And then it was late in the day and Stokes taking the extra half hour and everybody thought, well, they'll probably be nine down. We'll have to come back tomorrow. And then uh, Tom Hartley pulling it out of the bag right at the end. So I, I scribbled something down there. It takes about an hour. We're about an hour away here with the heavy, heavy traffic in Hyderabad. So I had a tuk-tuk ride uh, back to the hotel where I am now. I can't say it was the most pleasant tuk-tuk ride <laughs> or experience that I've had, but happy to be back in the hotel now. And, and it gives us a good chance to reflect on, on that win, really. I uh, looked at the, the numbers. I mean, the numbers are not very emotional. We shouldn't really start there, but it just gives an idea of how astonishing a win it is because that deficit of 190, England have only ever, I was going to say three times, we'll come to it in a minute, but only ever twice three come times. back from a bigger deficit on first innings. One was the great beefy test in 1981. I think the other time was in Sydney in 1894. The other time was your game in Centurion. But given that was a bit of a gimme from uh, Hansi and South Africa, I've kind of brushed that one from the record. Brilliant captaincy from me. A bit like Stokes in this game or brilliant Headingley in 81. It was just outstanding captaincy from me to win that game at Centurion. Where do you rate it? This Test match victory for England, where would you personally rate well, it? Just, just listen to Ben Stokes. and No doubt you heard him on telly. He says that's the greatest win of his captaincy. And, and you know, we were both in Pakistan. And we saw some unbelievable wins there, that that special win in Royal Pindi and, and then obviously winning the three games there. But I think this is un, undeniably the greatest win of, of basball, if you like, the basball era, just given where England were, the issues that they had. I mean, Leach has got a hematoma on his left knee, so he can't really bowl very much. His knee's the size of that. And so he's relying today on... Tom Hartley, a rookie debutant who had a difficult first innings, written off in some quarters. Rayan Ahmed, again, a rookie leg spinner uh, who struggled a bit with the ball. He's Root, who really is his kind of third or fourth spinner. Uh, and one seamer, Mark Wood. So slenderest resources to work with. So I think it's one of the best away wins, well, one of the best test wins that I've ever seen from an England team. And so... On the back of um, Ollie Pope's magnificent innings, where would you rate that innings? You know, Peterson in Mumbai, the 186 we saw there. Where would you rate this Pope innings we've just seen? Right up there. I think everybody was saying those with a, a kind of long, long perspective of, of England performances in the subcontinent. There have been some great ones, as you mentioned, Peterson and Cook in 2012, Gatting and Fowler with double hundreds in 85. Um, this one has to be right up there. Put, put it in context. A, again, where England were, 190 behind. Um, Pope himself, who has been out of the game for seven months with that shoulder injury and a really jittery performance from him on the first innings, in the first innings when he looked a bit out of sorts and very kind of nervy and skittish as he can be at the start of his innings. Uh, and then, you know, what were England, 160 for five or something at some point when Stokes got out and everybody's looking at their watches thinking we won't get to the end of day three. So I thought he just showed tremendous courage. You, you can go one or two ways, can't you? Right? When you're not sure of your form, you can try and grind your way out of trouble, but that's not the, the baseball way. So to have the courage to stick to his convictions, to stick to the style of play that England had promised under that kind of pressure, 
you know, some astonishing shots. I mean, that flick over yeah. his head, I don't even know what you'd call that. But the sweeps the and scoops, reverse. Yeah. It reminded yeah, me of the scoop a little bit, but yeah. it was an inc it was an incredible innings against three high quality spin bowlers at the top of their game on a pitch like that. I know it's slightly slower turn from day one, where it was a little bit damp, but it was still turning. And the game situation, the pressure situation, I think moving to three has obviously been very good for him. But I also think the regime has been good for him. You know, I think sometimes Oli. Pope did have a bit of a fear of failure. That's why he can be a little bit frenetic when he starts his innings, um, as he was in the first innings. But I think having Stokes and McCullum just saying, whatever the game situation, go out and express yourself. In previous regimes, he may have gone into his shell a little bit. We had Duckett talking about Cook, didn't we, in the 2016 series on the last day in Chennai. Cook saying to Duckett, just survive, just survive. And he looks back on that now, wishing that he didn't have the defensive technique to survive, to play his shots. And maybe with Pope, he had a realisation that, you know, why die wondering, show all the shots that he's had. The other thing we should mention, the debate to the balance of the side and the extra spinner or whatever. One thing playing the extra spinner did was give him a bit of batting depth. I mean, those runs in both innings from Rayan Ahmed and, and Tom Hartley were very, very valuable when you win by 28. Yeah, I think he put on 112 with Folks, uh, 64 with Ray and Ahmed, and 80 with Tom Hartley. We haven't really talked about Tom Hartley, so let's let's go there. I mean, yeah, that partnership this morning absolutely critical, and he looked good. I thought Tom Hartley with the bat first of all. Um, it's a bit like maybe Keaton Jennings in him. He's quite tall, upright left-hander, um, but he played the spinners very well. He looked very uh, composed. And that partnership was clearly critical. I mean, I think the lead was one, 149 when they came together and they put on 80. So without that partnership, the game is done, really. India winner to canter, don't they? You're not going to defend 149. Um, so that got England right up there. Uh, and then he bowled, he bowled really well today. There's, there's a number of things that, for the, the context of his performance. One is the difficulties of the first innings when he was given some tap by Jaiswell, the left-hander. And generally, the reaction to that, not that they take any notice of that rightly in the dressing room, but it annoyed me a little bit that Hartley was written off in some quarters and, and derided because I don't think he bowled as badly as the figures when Jaiswell smacked him around on that, on that evening suggested. You know, a left-hander can get after you when the ball is turning in. And it, I mean, not, not saying Tom Hartley bowled brilliantly at all, but I don't think he bowled as bad as the figures suggested. And, you know, there were one or two comparisons made to previous bowlers who'd maybe suffered a bit of stage fright on debut. And that annoyed me a little bit. But you, that is part of the context to what he had to deal with today. Both the pressure of knowing what happened in the first innings, the pressure of a spinner bowling in the last innings, in the fourth innings, when you're expected to win the game. And he's got to do a lot of the work because Leach is injured and not bowling very much. Wood's only going to bowl short spells, and Rayan Ahmed, you know, wasn't only given six overs. So all that pressure there spoke, I thought, volumes for his character, uh, and I was so chuffed for him today. I mean, seven wickets on debuts. I think he's the first England spinner to do that, seven wickets on debut since Jim Laker, uh, which is a great uh, kind of, not a comparison, because you can't really compare to the great Jim Laker, but it's a great... Stat, isn't it? And I was just so chuffed for him, the way that it all fell together for him today. I'll go back to that first innings, because that, for me, is vital. I think, first of all, you have to remember where a cricketer is. And sometimes when you're out of the game or on the side, on the periphery looking in, you forget about the pressures on debut. Uh, and, and it, you know, what pressure you put on yourself, the expectation, the three spinners in the opposition and how well... They are bowling and landing it on a sixpence. Um, what did you think about how he was handled in that first spell? Now, I, I read your article on it, and underneath there were some comments about maybe Root should have bowled at, at Jaiswal. Maybe he could have been taken off a bit earlier. And the reason I asked that is bit about Stokes and the captaincy of Stokes on that first innings. Now, if Stokes had taken him off early, that would have dented his confidence. But Stokes bowling him a little bit longer because Stokes is looking after his 
young man on debut. You know, Stokes has, we both agree and have said over the years, Stokes has a great emotional intelligence for a cricketer. And he could see that he was struggling a bit, but he looked after him. Do you feel that helped him when it came later in the game, that he'd had his captain have his arm around him in his difficult period on debut? Yeah, I don't know whether the only reason for that is that Stokes gave him that nine-over spell on the first day, but I think the environment created by McCullum and Stokes is very much that. I actually gave Tom Hart his cap uh, before the before the start of play, and I said to him, you know, you're in the best possible environment uh, to deal with all the contrasting emotions that you have on a, on the first morning. You know, you have those nerves and excitement. There's, you know, it's always a little bit of worry as well. You're not quite sure how it's going to go. And I felt that he's in the best environment to deal with that. Now, my own view at the time was that Stokes was right not to take him off after two overs, say. But I thought he, he went on a bit long for nine, just because I thought Root should have bowled at the left-hander. Agreed. Um, and obviously, you know, he, he got, Root got the left-hander out on the second morning. So I, I thought about, you know, five overs would have been right. I mean, in the end, he kept him on for nine and then Root got the left-hander the next morning. But the general point is absolutely right that you make, that I think under Stokes and in this environment, the players feel very valued and very backed, no matter the situation. Uh, and that's a, a really important factor. Um, so that will certainly have helped him uh, second time around. He had a really good start today and Ollie Pope was key there, wasn't he? Because... Pope's just spent six and a half hours batting, absolutely jiggered. He looked at the end of it. Quick shower, helmet on, right in there in the engine room at Silly Point and short leg. And two great catches, Jaiswal, short leg, and Shubman Gill, Silly Point. Both very sharp catches. And suddenly Tom Hartley feels a million dollars, doesn't he? And then at the end of his first spell, he got Rohit, which was the most important wicket of all because Rohit was the one batter today that I thought looked in control and confident. So that was a huge wicket. And then he's eight overs, three for spit. He's feeling on top of the world. And Stokes constantly turned to him when he needed a key breakthrough. And his best delivery of the day was that one towards the end in, in his final spell when he broke the Barat-Ashwin partnership with that beauty uh, to get India's wicket keeper. So... What a day, yeah. yeah they, they all mocked him at the end. It was a fantastic scene. Yeah, two or three things. I mean, having bigged up Stokes and the way he managed his, the, the, the debutant, I also think you have to give Hartley himself a lot of credit. We've been there when it's not going your way, especially with social media nowadays. He'd have been getting bombarded by the whole world, saying things about him, mentioning other players. We know how when you're out of the side, other players suddenly become better and should be there. So the mental toughness to come back second time round falls completely with the individual. But even in that, I thought some of Stokes' captaincy, how often do we see a silly point in cricket nowadays for the spinner? We hardly see it because of the way they play. But Shubman Gill, Pope was there to take the catch straight off the face of, of the bat. And the other thing I like about Hartley was he learns. And what I like about cricket is, is can you learn? And he said after the game, and I don't know if you saw it or noted it, but he said after the game, he saw the way the three Indian spinners bowled and he presumed his role was to come in the England side and with a high trajectory, high release point, fire it in. When actually, you know, he, he concentrated more on his lengths and more on getting his pace right than absolutely just bowling it as quickly as he could. Do you agree? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because this pitch wasn't the, the kind of rank turner, to use a phrase, that we'd seen in 21. I mean, I think... First of all, we've got to give the selectors credit. Uh, I mean, I know people think that Rob Key is our mate. He's one of those selectors. But they've taken some, some real punts over the last few years, and not many yet have gone wrong. You know, Will Jacks, five wickets on debut in Pakistan. Rayan Ahmed, on five wickets on debut in Pakistan. Now Tom Hartley. And they, they obviously discounted some of the county stats. You, you know, I've, I've seen it said that, England struggles in the first innings here of this game were reflection on county cricket. I don't think so because I don't think that the picks that they've made, Tom Hartley and Rayan Ahmed, were based on, on anything to do with county cricket. I can You can name a dozen spinners with better records last year than Tom Hartley, you know, but they saw something. They've, 
They've looked at what's been successful here, bowlers with a certain height and trajectory and pace, and that's why they made that selection. Now, you're right that that was based on the, on the kind of feeling that if the pitches are going to absolutely explode and turn square, that's what you need to do. But this wasn't that. And it was quite an interesting pitch for a test match, I thought, because on that first morning, it spun really sharply. And the natural instinct for everybody then to, is to think, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. In fact, what happened, I think the pitch was a little bit damp. The groundsman had watered it two days before. He'd had a Hessian mat on it. And there was a little bit of moisture in there. That's why it spun. And then actually it got a bit flatter and a bit slower until right at the end of the game today when it started to spin a bit more, but not particularly quickly and not with the bounce that there had been on that first morning. So I think you're right. He couldn't just stand there and kind of hurl it into the pitch and expect the pitch to do the rest because you needed a little bit more guile uh, than that on the on the you know after that first kind of three or four hours when there was a bit of dampness there. I mean, it's early days, and you know, England went one nil up in the last tour out there, didn't they? And then ended up losing the series convincingly. So now who knows what lies ahead? But you know, they've had Completely. four. Uh, I mean, they have had four incredible days, but. I agree with your point about this regime and how they select on just gut feel without fear of what it will look like if it does go wrong. And if it had gone pear-shaped, then it would have looked completely wrong because they had no stats to fall back on with the individual sometimes they select. But do you not think that's another asset? And I'm speaking um, with Michael Holding as one, one of the two most stubborn people I've ever met in Atherton and Holding. Do you not think that is an asset to a leader or any leadership group, is to have a bit of stubbornness about you. If you have a real belief in something that you're doing and the method that you're trying and the, and the policy that you're trying to do, don't be swayed by media and commentators and social media. You know, I remember being part of selection and people used to come in that selection and papers were writing off the ne- about the next cab off the, of the rank and pick him, pick him, pick him. And you went round in circles I quite admire a selection policy that know what they're trying to achieve and are stubborn about the route they want to go on. They're not going to divert from that route. I agree with that. And I also agree with the point that you make that we don't know what's going to happen in the rest of this series. (laughs) You know, it might go completely wrong. Who knows? But that was the point as well after the first innings that it was too soon to write off people as well, particularly in their first game or, you know, debut game as it was for for Tom Hartley. So I agree with that. I think you you have to have uh, a vision uh, and you have to have belief uh, in your instincts. And also they're brave, actually, again, because if you pick somebody whose numbers don't stack up and they don't stack up really for Tom Hartley or Shoei Bashir, two of the spinners that they've picked, if it goes wrong, you're going to get a lot of stick and you have to have the strength of character and strength of mind to to be able to cope with that kind of knowledge that down the line some stick might be coming your way. So, yeah, a, a lot lot to admire um, in that what sense. Do, we touched make, on. Go on. What do you make of India? I felt they were a bit clumsy in that first innings. There were a lot for Indian players. They played well. Jaiswal played well. Kaur Rahul played well. You know, they all a lot of them played well. Got scores, partnerships throughout. But there were some soft dismissals in there, a couple of run outs, a couple of long offs slogged in the deep. They could have been more ruthless. Completely agree. Rahul Dravid, their coach, I think, will be fuming tonight at that result. Not so much about today, actually, I don't think. You know, it, they still feel that they might have chased it down, but it's not easy to chase 230 on, on the last day of a test match in India. I think this would have been the fifth highest chase or something. Had they gone there, they really should have buried England in that first innings because England weren't bowling that well. The pitch wasn't that bad. All India's batters got good starts. And when you look at the dismissals, it wasn't as though they were getting knocked over with jaffers, you know, that were knocking, beating the outside edge and knocking the top of off. There were some long ops slap down deep mid wicket and deep square leg. Um, so as you say, some some sloppy dismissals. 190 is a nice lead, a, a really nice lead and a beautiful cushion to have. But it should have been a lot more. And you, you felt that perhaps in the days when 
Raoul Dravid was there. I know times change and approaches change and all that. Um, a middle order there would have been a bit more ruthless. Uh, and of course, they missed Coley. KL Rahul played beautifully, but he was a, a culprit in that first innings with a, a fairly sloppy dismissal and, and dropped a catch today, actually, obviously where Virat would normally be standing at slip. So, yeah, I felt they they could have put England away and then they dropped that dolly on the third evening. Akshar Patel dropped Pope on 110, I think he was at the time. And the lead was 67 at that point. And it was a pretty easy catch because he's a tall lad, Akshar, that reverse sweep. And game done then if you take that catch as well. So in any test match, at the end of it, you can always look back or nearly always look back at, at the what-if moments. There are always what-if moments. Uh, and India had a lot of those, I think. They'll be deeply frustrated um, that they lost that game, given the opportunities they themselves had as well. The other interesting thing, Nash, was the, the balance of England's side. I mean, I can't think of a, of a test match uh, that I've seen or that probably existed where in England have gone into a test match with fewer seamers than India. I mean, that would be unheard of, but India went in with the balance of two seamers and three spinners, uh, and England went in with one seamer and four spinners, effectively, uh, with Joe Root as the fourth. How did you think that worked out for them? Well, I said before the game, I would have gone slightly different. I'd have probably gone two and three because I saw Root as one of my frontline spinners in India. So I'd have probably gone Leach and Root and picked one out of Hartley and Rayan Ahmed as your third spinner. They saw it different, differently. Um, you know, as it is, Bumrah bowled nicely, for, very nicely for, for India. He got six wickets in the match. Um, I think Root is a genuine spinner in India. So I'm just not sure still if they need the fourth option. That just sort of gets one of them slightly under bowled. Like on that first day, Root was under bowled. And then at times, Leach, I know he was obviously with his knee or whatever. You felt like he was under ball, but actually worked out how I thought because Leach coming back from injury, you were a little bit concerned about his workload. And in the end, his workload was low because of a new injury. And then they had the other two spinners and Hartley second time round was brilliant. So um, a long answer. I think it worked out from the, the balance of the side with the ball. I wasn't 100 percent certain of. But what it actually did was gave, as I said earlier, quite a bit of batting depth. So what Ray and yeah. Ahmed might not have done with the ball, the runs he got down the order, when you win by 28 runs, the valuable partnerships he made in both innings, and the same with Hartley, irrespective if he hadn't bowled well second time round, uh, made a very useful contribution. So um, I don't know how they'll go. How did you feel Ray and Ahmed, for example, bowled in both innings? Well, I, I would say at the moment he looks, you, you know, you couldn't decide which is his stronger suit, batting or bowling. He he is where he is, isn't he? He's a, he's a teenage leg spinner who's not got that much experience. So he bowls what you might expect, which is a mixture of good and bad balls. The interesting thing in India, unlike Australia, say, is generally it's finger spinners that do the work. I know, you know, Anil Kumble, great wrist spinner, and they have had fantastic wrist spinners who've done well here. They left out their wrist spinner in this game and played the finger spinners. On pitches that do spin, that accuracy of your finger spinner is probably more what you want. But as you say, Ryan Ahmed's contributions with the bat, he struggled a bit with the ball today, to be honest, but he only bowled six overs, but his contributions with the bat were vital. I felt they missed Anderson in the first innings, actually. Just the control he might have helped give them and clearly he's not got Bumrah's pace, but he has got Bumrah's skill with the old ball and the new. So I don't know. It's it's early to say um, that may be an area that, that they will look at. And, and India may have an issue with the with one of their players. It was too early to say, but that brilliant, brilliant run out from Stokes, the back flick, the instinctive back flick. When I was watching Jadeja walk off, he was clutching his hamstring and that didn't look particularly good news for India. No, and if you remember what happened last time when India went 1-0 down um, in Chennai, the next pitch spun square. Um, so they may try and look at that and do it again uh, in Vizag. Who knows what that pitch will be like. You'll be our pitch expert again the day before 
the game. That was a brilliant bit of fielding, actually. The only other two cricketers I can think of that would have done that bit of fielding was Jadeja himself, the athlete that is Jadeja, and someone I played with, Mark War, who always used to flick the ball out of the back of the hand like Stokes did then. So that was an incredible bit of fielding. And, and also the glove work of Ben Folks. We haven't touched on Ben Folks. A big debate before the game about Bairstow and Folks and when it's spinning, get your best keeper in. There was one drop chance, wasn't there, of KL roll early on? Was there anything yeah, else? Yeah, the, the, the uh, umpire gave that bias and England didn't yeah. have a review, but it was a drop. Just going back to the Stokes thing, when you sat on your sofa going, you cannot do that, Ben Stokes. You cannot do that. I went straight Tell on Twitter. Twitter. Parody went your own on, commentary. Straight on Twitter to see a few people were saying that. So I sat there quite <laughs> chuffed, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> it's all about um, me. Ben Stokes, yeah, I mean... It, he had a pretty good game with the gloves. I think that that chance that you mentioned, I don't know whether you could, it was a chance because it was an edge. Replay showed it was an edge, but the umpire gave it as buys and England, were, England burned their reviews in 14 overs, <laughs> amazingly. But he batted well. That key partnership uh, with Pope once Stokes got out in the second innings. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm certain that England will keep that top seven and then decide what the best balance is with the ball. Um, uh, yeah, and if if Jadeja is struggling for India, that'll be that'll be a big call. So, yeah, I mean we can we'll we'll get down to Vizag. So England will be here tomorrow, and then they'll go down to Vizag the day after. That's down on the coast. Um, I spoke to KP actually, who's here commentating, and he said he played in a Legends T20 game there quite recently, and that it turned and bounced a lot. So it may be why, that... Why weren't we know, asked to play in the... Why, why haven't we been asked to play in any Legends games? <laughs> well, anyway, we've, forget the cricket. Forget the cricket. We haven't had gone on to the main subject, Kabaddi. How was Kabaddi? The Kabaddi was great. It was a bit like the darts at Ali Pali without the booze and without the fancy dress. Quite a so raucous atmosphere. Like and... It must be like, an, you know, for an American to be sat at, at the cricket, incomprehensible rules, albeit like basically British bulldog with a, a few fancy rules. But one thing I did realise that this is the perfect sport for Ian Ward. You've got to be low to the ground. You've got to have a low centre of gravity. No point being tall and lanky like, say, Tom Hartley or Stuart Broad. If you're five foot two, short to the ground, Kabaddi is the perfect sport for you. So when we no, pension just, off Ian Ward, we can send him to the Kabaddi pit and I reckon he'd be worth a few quid there. If there's no booze, that rules out Ian Ward, to be honest. So I bet you can't guess what I've been up to. Uh, no, Mark, I can't, Mark, other than City. Go on. Mark Butcher will be proud of me. I, I text him, actually. I was at Ronnie Scott's listening to Emily Sande play on Friday night and last night, I was at the O2 watching Depeche Mode. So I mean, I've become like a musical, you know, genius out there. Butch has become my best mate, go-to man for getting me into Ronnie Scott's on a Friday night. So we've had different well, I'm, I'm jealous. I was having dinner with Peterson, Morgan and Dinesh Kartik. Biryani? Did you get the biryani for the table? We got the biryani for the table. We're about to leave. Uh, the city of pearls and the city of biryani. We're gonna. I'm gonna head down to the south coast to Vishakapatnam, um, and I'm looking forward to that. So we will catch up, Nas, uh, just before the second test. We're gonna give it a few days, let the team settle, see where injuries, bodies are, and we'll have a preview of that second test uh, just before Vishakapatnam. But what 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 this victory has done has set it up perfectly. This was a great test here in Hyderabad, actually. They're about between 25 and 30,000 every day. There was clearly a lot of interest um, and England's win has set it up um, and it should be a fascinating series ahead. So I'll catch you in two or three days time, Nas, and uh, we'll see all our listeners then.